In this video, we'll give a brief guide to hash tables, focusing on what they are and how they are implemented. Hash tables are, in short, data structures for fast search, insertion, and deletion operations. As with many ideas, it's hard to be definitive about the original source of hash tables, but Hans Peter Loon, also well known for his work on summarization, is thought to have been the first to introduce the concept in a memo he wrote at IBM in 1953. What makes hash tables one of the wonders of the modern world is that in typical conditions, their operations are lightning fast. In particular, the average case complexity of searching, insertion, and deletion is constant. That is to say, it is independent of the number of data items stored in the hash table. This is really the key benefit associated with this data structure. A note of caution, though, is warranted. Their worst case behavior can be very poor, with searching, insertion, and deletion exhibiting linear complexity in n. When considering storage rather than operations, the complexity of hash tables is linear in the number of stored items. The fast average case performance of hash table operations means that they are well suited for implementing the ubiquitous abstract data types of set and map. The set abstract data type denotes a collection of objects with some associated operations. To keep things flexible, in our description of this collection, we'll assume that each object x has a key stored as an attribute x.key. As humorously noted by Donald Knuth, using keys for searching is highly appropriate, since many people spend a lot of time each day searching for their keys. Three of the essential set operations are insert x, which inserts object x into the set, delete x to remove object x from the set, and search key, which gets the object x if there's an x whose key matches the query key, and otherwise raises an exception. The map abstract data type corresponds to a collection of key value pairs, also with associated operations. These include insert key value, which adds a given key value pair to the map, delete key, which removes the key value pair with the given key from the map, and search key, which gets the value associated with the given key if present, and if not, raises an exception. In the case of both sets and maps, keys must be unique. Given their similar operations, implementations of both sets and maps will benefit from fast search, insert, and delete operations. We'll focus on sets for this video, but we can trivially achieve a map-like interface simply by adding a value attribute to each object in the set. In order to get the promised impressive operational speed for hash tables, the key idea is to replace searching, which can be a laborious process, with array indexing, which is very fast. This idea may not be intuitive, so let's walk through an example. Suppose we wish to store n objects, labelled x0 up to xn-1, that have corresponding unique integer keys, k0 up to kn-1. We'll assume that all keys fall within a set of integers ranging from 0 up to m-1. We'll use the grandiose term universe, denoted by u, to denote this space of all possible keys. So in this example, u is equal to the integers between 0 and m-1. We can achieve our goal of fast search with a simple trick. The trick is to build a big array that contains m slots, which are labelled from 0 up to m-1. Any unused slots are assigned a value of none, which is denoted here by the turquoise squares. Let's consider some example operations with our big array on two objects, x0, which we'll assume has a key of 2, and x1 which we'll assume has a key of 4. To insert x0 and x1 into our big array, we use their keys as indices. So x0 goes in slot 2, and x1 goes in slot 4. To delete x0, we go to its index, which is 2, and replace the contents with a none value. Finally, to search for the object in our data structure with a given key, in this case 4, we just look at index 4 and return its contents, which in this case was x1. This data structure, which is called a direct address table, seems gloriously fast and simple, and it is. 
we have our three desired operations in constant time. So, what is the catch? Consider the question of what happens if the universe of possible keys is much larger than the number of objects we want to store. The answer is lots of wasted space for empty array entries. To make this concrete, suppose we want to store the five IPv6 internet addresses of our closest friends, a very normal thing to do, and we choose to put them in a direct address table. Since IPv6 addresses use 128 bits, our universe now contains 2 to the power of 128 possible values. Somewhat inconveniently, this means that our direct address table to keep track of our friend's IP addresses will require more than a thousand trillion trillion one terabyte hard drives. At current prices for new drives on eBay, this would cost more than 28,000 trillion trillion pounds. That is assuming free delivery. Even for very close friends indeed, this is probably not a justifiable expense. Hash tables offer an ingeniously economic solution to this problem. Rather than using keys directly as indices, a hash table adds a layer of indirection by using a function, which we'll write as h, to compute the slot associated with each key. This function, h, which we'll call a hash function, maps each possible key in the universe into one of the m slots, and is designed with the goal that it will allow us to use a much smaller array to store our n objects. In fact, we're going to aim for an array with a number of slots, m, that grows linearly with the number of objects, n, rather than with the size of the universe of possible keys. Okay, let's clarify this using the insert operation as an example. With a direct address table, which is effectively a big array with the same number of slots as universe elements, if we want to insert object xi, we examine its key, ki, and use slot ki in the array to store the object. With a hash table, our goal is to get away with using a small array with a small number of slots that is proportional to the number of objects stored. To insert an object xi, we examine its key, ki, and pass it to a hash function h, then use the slot h of ki to store the object. Searches and deletions use the same indexing scheme. Let's look in more detail at hash functions. We'll start by supposing that our universe of keys, u, lies within the set of integers, z, and that our hash table has m slots. A basic hash function to pack integer keys into these slots is to compute the value of the key k modulo m. For example, if we have a hash table with five slots and three objects, x0, x1 and x2, with keys 2, 8 and 23, we can compute the slots by executing the hash function. 2 modulo 5 is 2, so x0 is mapped to slot 2. 8 modulo 5 is 3, so x1 is mapped to slot 3. 23 modulo 5 is also 3, so x2 also maps to slot 3. Uh-oh, we had a collision. This is bad news. As we'll see shortly, collisions can be handled, but they should be avoided by the hash function where possible, in large part because they slow things down. Broadly, we have two key requirements for our hash function. The first is that it should be fast to compute. The reason for this is clear. Our whole rationale for investigating hash tables is to accelerate operations, so we don't want to be hanging around waiting for the hash function to finish. Second, the hash function should minimize collisions, defined to be the event that distinct keys are mapped to the same value. Unless we know all the keys that will be used in advance, our ideal hash function for minimizing collisions rolls a fair m-sided die for each key k. Such a mapping is sometimes referred to as an independent uniform random hash function. The challenge here is that achieving true randomness from non-random data is theoretically impossible, so we can't implement this idealized hash function. The simplest practical hash functions to grasp intuitively are static hash functions. These include the division method we saw earlier using the modulus operator. In general, a naive implementation of this method tends to produce too many collisions to be useful, 
although it is helped a little by choosing m to be a prime number. The multiplication method is another simple approach. We choose a constant between 0 and 1, then we multiply this by the key and take its fractional part via a modulo 1 operation, scale this up by m, and then apply a floor operator. This allows more flexibility in the choice of m. We don't need to make it prime, for example. Unfortunately, static hash functions are vulnerable to unfavorable key distributions, either from mischievous adversaries or bad luck, in which many collisions occur, ruining the hash table performance. The essence of our way out of this problem, as observed by Ericsson, is to remember that input data is not random, so good hash functions must be random. Random hash functions represent an implementation of this idea in which we randomly choose a function from among a family of hash functions. A useful concept here is that of a universal family of hash functions, H, which has the property that the probability of collision for any distinct pair of keys is less than 1 over M, the number of slots. Note that here, the probability is over the hash functions that form members of the family, not over the keys. The textbook example of a universal family of hash functions, introduced by Carter and Wegman in 1977, is to pick a prime number larger than the size of the universe of keys. Then, define a hash function via h of ab equals ax plus b mod p mod m. Then, the family of hash functions, hpm, defined as the set of hab functions, is universal for a in the positive integers less than p, and b in the integers less than p. The parameters a and b are referred to as salts, which are sampled when the hash table is created, but then remain fixed. At a high level, when coupled with sensible collision handling schemes, universal hash functions are less vulnerable than static hash functions to unfavorable key distributions. In particular, an adversary can no longer pick out a sequence in advance that will guarantee worst-case runtime. Though not strictly required for hash tables, an important category of hash functions are cryptographic hash functions. These aim to offer additional guarantees, such as pre-image resistance, which means that it should be hard to recover the key from the hash value, and various forms of collision resistance, in which it is hard to find distinct keys that produce the same hash value. The trade-off is that cryptographic hash functions tend to be slower in order to achieve these characteristics, although, due to their importance, there are sometimes specialised CPU instructions to accelerate them for widely used variants like the SHA hash family. Hash functions have a wide range of applications. While here, we are mostly interested in their use for hash tables, which themselves underpin much of modern software, they are also used in algorithms for string matching, like rabin carp Cryptographic hash functions in particular are used to store passwords, create digital signatures and message digests, and are also used as part of proof-of-work schemes for securing blockchains. Perhaps the canonical example here is the use of SHA-256 as part of the Bitcoin blockchain. Designing robust hash functions for real-world usage is hard. Although the universal hash functions we mentioned earlier are robust against worst-case behaviour on average over different draws of the salts, they are still vulnerable to interactive attacks, where an attacker can observe whether keys are being hashed to the same slot by timing operations. To give an example of how this can be addressed, CPython, since Python 3.4, has used a hash function called siphash when hashing strings and bytes as a way to prevent denial-of-service attacks known as hash flooding, where an attacker deliberately induces collisions. We'll now turn to the topic of chaining, which provides one relatively simple way with which to handle hash collisions. Let's return to our example five slot hash table from before with the same hash function, and let's make some insertions. X0 with key two maps to slot two. X1 with key eight maps to slot three x2 with key 23 also maps to slot 3, but finds it full due to a hash function collision. This is resolved by combining x2 and x1 in a data structure, 
typically a doubly linked list which allows for fast deletions. Inserting X3, whose key is 98, produces another collision, so we insert it into the linked list for slot 3. When it comes to searching for the object with a given key, say 8, we go to the slot and traverse the list until we find the object with the matching key, in this case X1. To delete an object from the hash table, we can remove it from the linked list, which is then stitched back together. Let's now look at how efficient a hash table is going to be with chaining in the worst case scenario. If we've used doubly linked lists, insertion and deletion can be performed in constant time, so we'll focus on the cost of search. The worst case search scenario occurs where all n inserted keys collide, so all objects are mapped to the same slot. In that case, the cost of search is theta n, since it requires a linear scan along the linked list containing all n elements, or log n if we've taken the time to keep the list sorted in order to enable binary search. Let's turn to the average scenario. We'll focus on the cost of an unsuccessful search, i.e. the case when the search key does not exist in the hash table because it's simpler to analyze. As a first step, we'll define the load factor of the hash table, alpha, to be n, the number of items in the table, over m, the number of slots. We'll assume that our hash function is universal, and so the collision probability between any distinct pair of keys is less than or equal to 1 over m. Inserting n items produces chains whose expected length is the number of items divided by the number of slots, i.e. alpha. Consequently, the average cost of an unsuccessful search is theta 1 plus alpha, which is the cost of hashing plus the cost of a linear scan along the average chain length. The average cost of successful search, in which the target key does exist in the hash table, turns out to have the same complexity as unsuccessful search, though the analysis is slightly more involved. An alternative approach to chaining is to use open addressing, terminology that was coined by William Wesley Peterson in 1957. The simplest variant of an open addressing scheme is linear probing, which remaps each colliding hash to the next available index. To see how it works, let's return to our hash table with five slots, our division hash function, and the task of inserting four elements into the table. Insertion of x0 with key 2 goes into slot 2 as before. Object x1 with key 8 goes to slot 3. Object x2 with key 23 also maps to slot 3. Since this slot is taken, we examine the next slot and, finding it free, insert x2 there. Finally, object x3 with key 98 also maps to slot 3. It's full, so it checks slot 4. This too is full, so it wraps around and checks slot 0. This is free, so it is inserted there. Search follows the same scheme. To find the object associated with key 98, it is hashed to slot 3, and then checks consecutive slots until the object, in this case x3, is found, or until it hits an empty slot, in which case the search returns unsuccessfully. Deleting an object is somewhat complicated. While we can remove an object simply enough, in this case x2 in slot 4, we leave a hole which will mean that x3 can no longer be retrieved by linear probing, which will exit once it finds slot 4 empty. There are a few solutions to this. One approach is to replace the deleted object with a special deleted marker, here denoted by the letter D. These markers can be swapped out by new insertions or thrown away if the hash table is resized. Still, it's not ideal to use up space with these markers, and the scheme is a little unsatisfactory. Other approaches have also been devised that involve shifting elements in the probe sequence to fill the holes. One thing you might have noticed is the natural tendency of linear probing to form long chains of collisions, an effect referred to as primary clustering. Since this can lead to many consecutive probes, Alternative open addressing schemes have also been explored. In general, open addressing requires the construction of probe sequences, in which a hash function produces not just a single slot, 
but a sequence of slots. This sequence must correspond to a permutation of the integers 0, 2, m-1 to ensure that each possible slot in the hash table is visited. One general scheme for achieving this, while avoiding primary clustering, is to employ double hashing, where two hash functions are combined to produce a probe sequence. Here, i indexes the position in the probe sequence. To ensure that this sequence does indeed visit every slot, h2k and m must be co-prime. Linear probing can in fact be viewed as a special case of double hashing, with a second hash function that maps every key to the value 1. Analyzing the behavior of open addressing is a little more complicated than chaining. However, one result that's useful and somewhat intuitive is the number of probes involved in an unsuccessful search in the case when the load factor is less than 1, which is to say the table is not completely full. The analysis requires the assumption of independent uniform permutation hashing, which implies that any key is equally likely to be mapped to any permutation of the slots. The result here is that the maximum number of probes is 1 over 1 minus alpha, which is equal to the geometric progression 1 plus alpha plus alpha squared plus alpha cubed, etc. Intuitively, we get the 1 because we always have at least one probe. Then, as noted by Nuth, with roughly probability alpha, we need more than one probe. With roughly probability alpha squared, we need more than two probes. With roughly probability alpha cubed, we need more than three probes, etc. In addition to the core open addressing algorithm, various reordering schemes have been considered that shift objects around in the hash table to improve search behavior. This idea was originally considered by Peterson in his 1957 paper. Two notable variants of this concept are Brent's method, which rearranges objects to reduce the average search cost for successful searches, and Robin Hood hashing, which tries to reduce the variance of the number of probes associated with searches. It is useful to note that while linear probing appears somewhat naive thanks to the primary clustering problem, it's often not too bad in practice, because it benefits heavily from caching effects when consecutive probes fall within the cache. Finally, to give an example of a real-world implementation, CPython dictionaries, at least in the current version, which is 3.9, use open addressing with pseudo-random probing in combination with various heuristics to prevent primary clustering. CPython dictionaries use a maximum load factor of two-thirds, at which point they resize the underlying table, typically by doubling it to create more space. These choices are partly designed to work reasonably well across a wide range of scenarios, but they are particularly optimized for object attribute and class method lookups, since they are used internally by the interpreter to run Python code, and are thus executed many, many times. In the video description, you can find links to further resources, slides, and references. I hope you have a wonderful day.